Hello friends, in this video we're going to look at this Heath Kit shortwave receiver. This is model GR64. My brother found this at an auction for cheap and deservedly so. It's pretty scruffy as you can see. I haven't done anything to it so far. It has what appears to be some water damage based on rust on the top and swelling on the back. On the front, this meter is knocked out of place. And although I usually kind of plug things in to see what they'll do when they start up, in this case I'm going to take the lid off of it and get some idea of if the damage inside, evidently due to water, is so severe that we don't even want to power it up or at least want to take some extra precautions. Turns out that it only had three of the four chassis screws which I've already taken out. So let's lift the lid here. Let's see what we've got. Oh, that's interesting. We've got an actual wasp's nest in there. Two. I see one on this side. Let's hope uh, the wasps are long gone. You can take a look at the speaker. It's got some problems, but might still be usable. This is a fine tuning knob that seems to work as intended. Aside from the wasp nests and dirt, I don't see any real damage to it. Uh, we're missing our little pilot light bulb here but that's probably okay here's the back side of the meter that's knocked out of place the light bulb for this part is also gone let's run the tuning control that seems to work okay I see the capacitor plates here are a little bit bent but that's probably either not an issue or something we can just adjust you can see that the needle moves in conjunction with the capacitor plates, so that's a pretty good sign that the tuning mechanism is working. I can see in one tube 12BA6, which I'm guessing is an audio amplifier tube, I'm not sure, but it's not shielded. So probably some of these other tubes that are shielded are either RF or IF tubes or possibly even some sort of audio preamp or something. Got a series of tuning coils. This is probably an output transformer for the speaker. This is the antenna leads which is this very sad looking antenna piece that could possibly be reused but maybe not. Now before we think about this too hard let's talk a little bit about shortwave and shortwave receivers. Shortwave is kind of a thing of the past because uh, there are so many other ways to get broadcasts from around the world notably uh, internet. I have one fairly similar to this that I've tried out before in fact, let's go look at that for a second for comparison. This is the one I've had for several years. I've only tried it out a couple of times. It's slightly larger than the other one, and the model is GR54. So I don't know if that means it came first and they found a way to reduce it. But a lot of the features look about the same. The tuning dial and things like that. The other receiver I just showed you is uh, fairly similar in construction to this with the lid off. Basically a fairly simple tube-based uh, radio receiver for shortwave. Now shortwave is kind of a thing of the past in a lot of ways because of the fact that uh, if you want to get international broadcasts, now you can just do that off the internet and it's very easy. But in the old days, you could get international broadcasts from even across the other side of the globe 
because this shortwave frequency band has the property that the radio waves bend around the earth uh, in a certain way at a certain time of night and you could get stations that were very far away when I tried the other receiver a few years ago um, about the only station I could get that was anything at all was uh, a Cuban propaganda station which aside from being a curiosity that didn't really hold my interest for very long now in the, this case the receiver is uh, pretty scruffy these are not rare they're not valuable this one would need a lot of work to get it back into some sort of um, you know nice condition it's got some problems that probably can't be fixed cosmetically like this cracked plastic and maybe this aluminized plastic that's where the aluminum is coming off so this isn't really of much interest on a functional basis or a collector basis um, the honest and sad truth is it's basically worth less than its parts so that might mean that we pull it apart oh I just noticed we've got some tube numbers listed on the circuit board I see 12 AV6 12 AQ3 and 12 BE6 I don't remember precisely but 12 BA 6 there I guess oh yeah that's the one I read the 12 BA 6 off of earlier um, and as, as we keep going this is probably the main power transformer and the filtering capacitor uh, I'm not quite sure where the rectifier tube is. It might be this one. So I guess just for fun I'm going to plug this in. We might hear some static or something that kind of indicates some sort of nominal operation. Watch the tubes glow. But the honest truth is that this really doesn't have any potential for saving. So I've got a little test set up here, power strip that's off, going to this is a current limiter I built with this 300 watt light bulb as the current limiting element which is in series with the power line. So if the current is minimal that'll drop the voltage a little bit but not too much. And if the current is high then that'll limit it and uh, start to become very bright so that gives us both a visual indicator that something's wrong if it is like let's say there's a dead short over here it keeps this unit from toasting itself so I'm going to turn on the power strip we've got 121 volts here I'm going to go to watts so we'll turn it on and see what happens. We should hear a little hum. Okay. 45 watts and then it's going down. Probably settle in on some number. So let's call it 38 watts as it settles in. Maybe going down a little further. That seems like a pretty reasonable value for this type of unit. I'm going to turn the volume up and see if we hear any humming or crackles. So that little crackle is actually kind of a good sign as far as the uh, audio section of this working right. Let's switch bands. This is still going down, settling in at towards 31 watts. Oh, I see this 
meter jumping around as I change bands. So the way this works is you've got these A, B, C, D, and L bands that are um, those may be standardized in some way I'm not sure but KC means kilocycles we would now say kilohertz MC is megacycles we would say megahertz so um, like A is actually the AM band I think and here we've got our option of AM standby which I guess is kind of a mute setting and CW so that has to do with a um, so we're getting kind of a space invaders type of squeal here which is actually not all bad considering what uh, what I've got here. Let's see if we go to got the volume turned up all the way. So our power continues to go down I guess as the tubes warm up. So BFO means beat frequency oscillator. Um, that has to do with the CW mode I think. I'm not sure the hams out there who know that offhand can leave me a comment. I had a ham license many years ago but I've let it lapse and I'm no expert on these things. I just have kind of a minimal knowledge. Uh, I think there should be an indicator for this band spread which I thought was fine-tuning but it's actually probably a bandwidth of the channel you're listening to. So that's CW mode. So that, I believe that lets you in effect set the the tone of what you hear for CW. Now just for fun I'm gonna see if I can hook up a little AM loop antenna to it and see if anything comes through. Went ahead and cut off this little uh, antenna that came on the back and rigged up this A and loop antenna that I had. So since the A band here seems to be broadcast AM, we may be able to pick up a station from that. So I'm going to turn everything back on here. Okay, here's a slight hum. Go to band A. We'll tune the dial from one end to the other. So starting at the high end, we'll just go down. Got the volume turned up all the way. I'm not hearing anything at all. So that's another sign. I'm going to slow down here around. I know we've got a station at 610 in this area. Nothing, nothing around that. And here's something else I've noticed. This thing that's called band spread is not connected at all explains why we don't see a needle. There should be a needle mechanism around these pulleys kind of similar to this other one. But there's no electrical connections to this air gap capacitor that runs it. And as another point, uh, maybe it wasn't the best thing to do to run this with a wasp nest still attached, but you know Let's assume that a wasp nest is an insulating material. At least it's on top of these uh, power input wires. So I'm going to say that this is definitely a parts piece. Um, we'll see how far we go with that.
probably just completely tear it apart and throw large parts of it away. The tubes are easy, we could just pull those out and keep them as well as the tube shield. Um, the transformers are easy, they have some value even though it may be minimal, it may be in the small dollar range. The speaker is uh, very likely worthless. You know, we've got some knobs and things. Uh, this little meter is kind of cool. That might be one to throw in the junk box. So, I think we're at the point where we can be sh sure that we want to just tear this thing apart. Now before you try this at home kids, this uh, power supply capacitor may have some uh, voltage stored in it if it's still working. So after we get underneath this, there's going to be a shock hazard at the bottom of this capacitor somewhere and whatever wires lead to it. As an additional test I noticed heat radiating off these tubes. That's perfectly normal for a tube a unit like this. Well, I've consulted my brother who's the proud owner of this item and uh, he said that he'd be willing to sell it uh, as is or for parts on eBay. So that'll be uh, where it ends up. I think I'll go ahead and take my chances on these wasp nests. There can't possibly be any wasps in there by now but uh, We'll try to pull those out and see what happens. Looks like they've attached to uh, this uh, meter wire in the one case and to the transformer input on the other case. Or might be the output, I'm not sure. Well, we'll just start crunching on this and see what happens. No wasps so far. You can see some wasp larvae or cases, whatever they're called, down in here. Some nice round holes in the mud. Round holes here. Guess I'll just keep nipping at that. Try not to damage the transformer in the process. Now the interesting thing, if you resold this, would you have to have a disclaimer of if I hadn't taken the wasps out, you know, beware of wasp nests or something, or includes free wasp nest, or I don't know quite how you would advertise it. So we'll do some cleanup on that later, but Basically, that's been a success. So we'll repeat the procedure on this one. My big Kleinman's pliers aren't even big enough for that. This type of mud is pretty easy to break, but... I say that, but it's not as easy as I thought. more wasp shells inside there. This one I don't have to worry about damaging much of anything because the only thing it appears to attach to is this wire which probably isn't very fragile. Okay. I'm not quite sure what I should charge my brother for that but Okay, so that was a success. We'll just clean all this out. So just to make this real simple, I'm going to just dump it into the trash can and then kind of sweep it out separately. We're going to leave a little bit of fun for the new owner to do. The new owner might just part this out anyway, rather than fix it. Uh, 
I'm not particularly afraid of wasps, but I'm also not a fan. So, it's a little bit eerie to handle wasp stuff, even though, you know. So, that's a reasonably good job. We can come in here with a vacuum and do a quick vacuum, I think, next. Put it back on our carousel of progress. So with kind of a light cleaning, nothing too substantial, we can sell this in good faith as wasp free. Whoops, I just found a little piece over here. No, it's not a junior mint. In the old days where tubes were common, the first thing you do when something didn't work would be to test the tubes on a tube tester. Those were often provided at your corner drugstore, which would also sell you tubes. I don't have a corner drugstore with a tube tester, but I do have a tube tester. So we're going to pull those out and uh, test them individually. This has four tubes each of a different type so they need to be tested individually with different settings on the tube tester I went into that a little bit in one of my other videos but uh, in this one I'll just kind of show you the results for each tube so I've removed the shield off of this tube rotate it and gently pull it out 12 AQ5 is the type number here's the shield I've set up the tube tester according to the settings for this tube. Let it warm up for a couple minutes. We're going to turn on the test button and see what the meter tells us. So this one's in the good range. So we could put it back in, but I'll leave it out for now in case uh, it turns out if all the tubes are good then uh, we'll ship it with the tubes as they are separated from the unit. Next we've got our 12 AV6 tube which I've extracted and put in the tester. So this has three independent elements. First one tests good. I have to change the setting uh, to test the other two elements. So I've changed the settings. This one says uh, to use the diodes OK scale, so evidently this is a diode section of the tube. So you'll see that it shows bad red at the top, but it's actually in the OK range for diode on the lower scale of green. We'll repeat that for the other element. This is the other element of the same tube, three of three. Again, it's in the green for diodes OK. That's a good tube. Next we'll do the 12 BA6. For this tube we're back on the bad good scale at the top. It's in the good range. Now this one has a second test I think on the same element. So we'll change the settings and try that one. Here's a second test on this 12 BA6 tube. For this one, you don't look at the meter, you look at this short light. So that doesn't come on, so that's good. That means that our tube is good. This is the 12 BE6 tube, which was shielded. So we're ready to test the 12 BE6 tube. It's in the good range. This one also has a short test that goes with it, which is K6 here. Turn that back on and let it warm up. Still warm from before mostly, so we don't have to wait too long. Look for our short test. Nothing there. So this is also a good tube. So putting this all together, we don't have any reason to believe that the tubes are bad in this. We can sell it now with the uh, 
notice that the tubes have been tested that's additional information of interest to the buyer for shipping purposes we'll package the tubes separately which is kind of good practice it keeps them from coming loose and getting broken during shipping the buyer will need to consult the uh, markings on the circuit board or other documentation to know which one to put in which but we should be dealing with a sophisticated buyer who can handle something like that after I put each tube back in its shield I marked it with a little painters tape and a pen the 12 BA6 tube has a clear type number on it so uh, that doesn't need to be marked but some of the others the uh, type number was uh, worn down a little bit which can make them hard to put in the proper spots you'll notice these are all 12 volt tubes with the same socket so it's entirely possible to put them in the wrong socket and uh, you know cause further damage if the buyer isn't careful so trying to make that foolproof got the lid back on it ready to be shipped off to the next proud owner uh, unit itself this antenna and our four tubes. That concludes our video on this Heath Kit shortwave receiver, model GR64. Thanks for watching and bye bye.